Dr. Hillary, thank you so much for this introduction. Um, and it will help me stay under my 45 minutes. <laughs> because you brought up many things that um, I think are relevant and important and the reason why I'm here. Um, Oh, I should also mention, uh, with our wonderful award-winning buildings, they might feel a bit cool in here, but it will warm up in time. The room was full a little bit before, so that's my phone. <laughs> <laughs> writer to this talk. Um, over the years I've attended quite a few inaugurals around the world, mainly in Europe and, and here, and ranging from deeply theoretical ones in Zurich, uh, it's probably because it's like a diva, a viva, um, but it's also because they earn six figure salaries, but also um, to very playful ones about personal journeys, trajectories, um, and the passions and obsessions that we have. So I started with that first one, and I shifted towards the second. And the main reason being, I kept hearing this as a celebration. Um, it wasn't because of the salary figure. Um, it was mainly because I'm in the School of Art and Design. And I'm very happy to be here. I feel right here, and I can't wait to see what we're gonna do. I also thought maybe some of you might have read my book, so you may be inspired too. Um, and I'm also gonna do this because I regard writing as a creative act. Here's my palette. My favorite um, is Palatino, uh, which is a text, and it's my favorite to work with on screen. It's from uh, Hemon Zoff. The writers in any Latin derived language have only 26 symbols in the set of glyphs, and the writers in here know what I'm talking about, or diacritics to make things more interesting. The enormous number of literary terms used in the analysis of language, like analogy, assonance, allegory, allusion, and alliteration, examples of the latter. It's just a tiny fraction of terms with only just the ones that start with A. <clears throat> we even have some tools to assist us, for better or for worse, and any of you who know what's down at the bottom of the right-hand screen that dates you, <laughs> I will come back to the infuriating cookie a little bit later. We use these to write about art, and writers and artists need one another in both directions, our work to essay, essay to our work, to make work, works known to our, our, our audiences. <clears throat> this is why writers surround themselves with art books in a similar way as artists do with their inspirations and obsessions and references. And today you're going to see a lot of images as we go along. Besides the solitary labor of writing a manga, <clears throat> I always aim to work as collaboratively as possible um, because the best and the most pleasurable, pleasurable work grows from the constituency of like-minded co-conspirators. You'll also see some of the artists and writers I've been fortunate to work with over the years from undergrad assistants to brilliant PhD students to um, full-blown professors. My aim today is to show you why animation matters. <coughs> and I hope when I'm done, you'll see why it does, could or should matter to you too. I'll include a few of my theori theoretical positions about animation as well. And I should emphasize that I have a skeptical but proactive attitude to theorizing animation. I'll first contextualize with some of the key debates in animation studies, followed by an illustrated loosely chronological trajectory, not with the red text, of some projects and how I've got to where I am now. Partway through, I'll be shifting from a verb in the talk's title to a noun, the actual matter, the media and stuff of arts-based animation, that's filmed also using a celluloid photochemical carrier that's also tangible matter. Then we'll move to the digital and animation in the workplace and research, and explore some of animation's applications and uses outside its commonly understood purpose for visual entertainment. 
which include disciplines taught and researched at MU's other schools, which is, again, a main reason why I came to middle science. I have a lot of main reasons for being here. <laughs> I'll also consider, I'll conclude with a short visual tour of what I'm currently working on and some observations on animation's ubiquity and why its pervasiveness, which is not the same as ubiqui ubiquity, why it matters. Animation, like live action, is a mode of cinema, and a complete taxonomy includes hundreds of techniques, styles, and technologies. That's why I started this with a loop, so you can see some of the diver diversity of works that you're not going to see in commercial cinemas and TV. It can be roughly separated into three categories. Planar, flat animation, which is drawn or painted on paper or cells, so-called because they were made of celluloid. And, and that's a mimetic te technique that imitates or represents the real world through artworks. The second is object and puppet animation, that cinematically captures spatial, physical, temporal, and structural elements originating in the natural world. <clears throat> Both are created using frame-by-frame -frame shooting of a succession of incrementally changed profilm materials Serially developed flat artworks or objects and puppets in miniature set design. You'll see some images that explain this. 24 frames shot this way create one second, one second of projected films. And the animation staff and students know what that means. <laughs> 24 artworks for one second. <clears throat> the third is digital animation, non tangible electronic code generated through computer software. So, the study of animation is riddled with few problems, not least its definitions and terminologies in a wider context of movie image culture. Most available descriptions and definitions of animation as a category or genre are much like the term experimental film, <clears throat> an unspecific um, catch-all that keeps an enormous, historically far-reaching, and artistic, di artistically diverse body of works into one pot. An example of this is the Library of Congress movie image genre guides um, Guide. It lists 129 film genres and allocate, allocates animation to a sublist as one of three appendices. The others are experimental film and advertising. Animation is then classified in 10 subdivisions solely according to techniques and technologies. It's not described as all the other genres are with historical, ideological, aesthetic, or content based descriptors. This has many consequences, including that in libraries, titles and animation are also often categorized under, cataloged under genre, sharing shells with the Western, horror film, and film noir. Others classify these texts within film studies, while still others allocate them to sections on graphic design, illustration, or comics. So you might ask, why is this a problem? Well, it's one that I'm attempting to solve in publications, events, grants, <laughs> whenever I can, um, because animation is much more than a single genre. Uh, I'm also doing things on the film studies scholar. It's much more than a single genre unless the classification is based on a technique or, as Edwin Carroll has proposed elsewhere, as a principle. The images on the screen, vertically from your top left to bottom right, are examples of the genre's character study, family drama, animal film, science film, film noir, po political documentary, screwball disaster film, psychological epic, and road movie. This could have important influence on what is taught in research at universities, since conventional definitions of genre can and do often apply to many animation films, ideologies, iconography, film historical movements, and narrative content. My point is that we need to be clear about what we mean when we use the word animation. A genre, a technique, a film mode, a film mode an art form. So there's currently no scholarly consensus on a single definition of animation, and the ones in circulation vary between institutional, historical, ontological, teleological, functional, and aesthetic definitions, and they're reductive in various ways. In a collection on animation theory that's now in production with Duke University Press, an essay I wrote that's called Animation in Theory, my title includes the skepticism I mentioned before, proposes foundational features that set animation apart from live action conditions and properties that need to be satisfied for a moving image work to be categorized as filmic, non-digital animation. These are the main points in summary, and I think I might make slides available because I don't want to waste time. What the basic point is that we need to be work with emblematic films, use film analysis methods with parametric analysis, we need to uh, talk with art historians, we need to talk with the makers, sculptors, science, art, and technology. And we need to approach these high-flown generalities by a roundabout piecemeal route and work across the multiple fronts and dis disciplines of dialogue and the same exchange. 
What remains distinctive about animation more in its more than a century of celluloid-based production is its unlimited potential to visually represent events, scenarios, and forms that have little or no relation to the real world. <clears throat> this has not changed, and now, in the striving to realism, CGI digital tools are enabling filmmakers to create a whole new screen experience. I think I'm allowed to take this out. <laughs> 40% of your body stays on with a hat. So, a whole new screen experience that is increasingly gaining on photo indexicality until now the exclusive domain of photochemical celluloid. While artists have been quick to embed the techniques, scholars are only beginning to really deeply engage with the cinematic form that can have more to do with sculpture, algorithms, and painting than with the genres of narrative live action cinema. The expansion of animation and visual culture and its cultural, technical, and stylistic distinctiveness really puts into question whether we can be purists with regard to what is deemed a worthy subject for critical evaluation and analysis. I really believe that. There are a number of key debates in the growing field of animation theory that I'm both generating <coughs> and contributing to, in the main by developing pluralist and interdisciplinary methods, in a similar way that film studies did in its formative years, to develop approaches that take into account the differences between celluloid and digital film experiences and the platforms that these technologies use. As a film studies scholar, I naturally engage with formal and aesthetic, stylistic, cinematic pr parameters, but I also work with theoretical and aesthetic approaches from fine art, feminist and cultural studies, and art architecture, to material culture and philosophy of perception. I do this because animation is impossible to funnel into a theory of animation <clears throat> for a number of reasons. It's not a single profession or discipline. Other academic and academic understanding and inquiries both originate from and extend into other disciplines. I tested these methods in my 2011 book on the Clay Brothers. It's an example of one 10-year research odyssey that a number of people in this room have been through when we've worked with those 26 letters, that also involved moving countries, and, ended, and it ended as a poetics of their puppet animation films. I'll talk through some slides that show some of the research, but first I, I'll talk you through some of the slides that show some of the research, um, and it really focused around the 1986 uh, film called Street of Crocodiles, 21 minutes long, that many artists, scholars, and others have said changed their thinking about animation. <clears throat> I saw it for the first time as a student in a really dark basement in 1991 on VHS, <laughs> and it was an epiphany that remains as radiant today for me as it was then. I wrote this book for all the people who came up to me after animation screenings that I programmed that were speechless and just grab my arm and say, they couldn't describe, so I tried in, you know, modest way to do that. <clears throat> so I guess this trajectory journey started at the University of Zurich where I studied um, before Bologna <coughs> and we just did something called the Witzes yet a master's. <coughs> it just gives you a bit of a sense of the mood and the feeling in Zurich. Um, there's a beautiful old, old part of town but the two most important people for me were Fritz Sen of the James Joyce Foundation. He kept me from quitting because stopped me studying because I just didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> of uh, English, and Noel Brinkman, who was the most rigorous doctor mother, as we call them there. She was my PhD supervisor, um, most rigorous teacher I've ever, ever known. And she's an experimental filmmaker, so she knew what she was talking about. <clears throat> These are some of the works that were uh, I was working on when I was a student, Ulysses uh, and James Joyce. They're, it's like a virus if you can assume it, but it doesn't. And Finnegan's Wake is on my um, shelf for when I retire and keep this until I die. <laughs> Hannah Hoek, uh, I was also working very much with, I came to animation actually through an experimental avant-garde uh, film and the artworks that were done by um, some, um, some of the, the work around that time. These are our timing, so I don't know which time, but I do want to mention also, also, continent, also continental philosophy. We've got a few continental philosophers uh, here in our, in art design, and there's lots to be found in that approach um, in terms of the artistic experience that we have. <coughs> I wasn't working on animation. Uh, I focused mainly on independent film, feminist film. I started the first, or I, I ran the first um, student module, we call it, on feminist film studies. Um, I worked a lot on uh, independent, I said that already. Um, and I started to become really interested in special effects in science fiction. Uh, I got made fun of at the University of Zurich for teaching these. I had the most students, and it was the most popular courses. That just goes to show you that you should actually wait a little bit until you find out what people are interested in. Uh, and I worked using film studies really to try and understand these works. So it took me to the Street of Crocodiles. I did a, uh, I guess it would be 
like a dissertation quite easily at your undergrad level um, on studio crocodiles because it works with the same principles of live action film with the camera, lighting, setups, objects. There's just no actors, but you have the same kind of camera setups and use and uh, recording the, the natural world. You have puppets. That gives you a sense of scale, which was something I was very interested in. Uh, I had a lot of visits with the Quay Brothers. They happen to actually still be very good friends. And there's two things you should never do. Write about someone who's alive and write about someone who are your friends. So they were very, very kind to me with my impeaching questions to them. And I wasn't on this studio visit. Uh, that was way before I'd even known about their work. <clears throat> um, these are some of the images that um, just blew me away. I mean, I, I have, have to use a colloquialism to say it. Uh, I was also speechless, and I wanted to understand why these moved me. What you're not experiencing is the music. And Slavoj Žižek said 50% of film is sound. So please bear that in mind when you're looking at this. But what I ended up coming to, what kind of stopped me, um, was, and I'll just mention one of the main theoretic models that I developed, um, had to do with what you're seeing here. Um, and I developed them through a few incisive texts that generated some of my thinking early on, including Michel Chion, Heinrich von Feist in the Marinette Theater, Anthony Buechler on Uncanny Architecture, and philosophers Jane Bennett, Noel Carroll, and Jean Williams. It's relevant to my bibliography with almost no animation studies titles. It's also an indication of the skepticism I have, the skepticism I have towards the animation studies text. Some, but not all. I built on these thinkers to describe the perceptual and physical contradiction of experiencing animated figures on screen and as matter, the stuff we can hold in our hands. Another key figure was Sergei Eisenstein early on, who identified core perceptual dilemmas, ontological and aesthetic qualities and phenomena of animation in his 1920s writing on Disney. Disney was considered a radical back then. Eisenstein was also one of the first to raise the concept of the anima that originates in Aristotle's poetics and means endowing of life or soul to inanimate uh, entities. The term, on my view, has been beaten to death in animation studies. So I wanted to posit an alternative, and I worked through concepts of vitalism. I worked with Alfred Schopenhauer and Bruno Schulz's definitions of the generatio e provoca uh, to develop a typology of vitalist, vitalist objects in the Quay's films, the examples you see here. And if you want to read my book, it's over there. Explain it a little bit better than I am right now. Um, and these, this typology of vitalist objects that, when animated, allow the viewer to experience a non human, non anthropomorphic form of a vitalist spirit via a cinematic transmutation of matter, organic and inorganic, through the remarkable concept of the generatio of This has not let me go yet. And in my own essay in the pervasive animation uh, collection, I went back to Aristotle and wrangled with his concepts of first and second entelechy. Entelechy being, I quote, a hypothetical agency not demonstrable by scientific methods that in some vitalist doctrines is considered an inherent, regulating, and directing force in the development and functioning of an organism. I used his notion of a being in action but developed a concept for animated entities not demonstrating a soul, which is a condition for Aristotle's entelechy. In brief, my main propose, proposal was for a third soulless entelechy that some of the Quay's animated metaphysical regions can demonstrate. And I hope it can be a model to engender more academic engagement with puppet and object animation. We always hope our books are gonna have some kind of small influence on the people that we I worked through the book with film studies and interdisciplinary methods from architecture, English literature, philosophy, film studies analysis to craft evidence of psychosexualia, and Italian futurist and musicologist Luigi, Luigi Russolo's concept of resident noise. I adopted an amended version of Noel Carroll's methodology for criticizing artworks through description, classification, contextualization, elucidation, interpretation, and analysis. <coughs> So what I found out about the plays as I got to know their work and have discussions with them um, was they're very very highly influenced by literature. And here you see on your left uh, Franz Kafka, on the right Bruno Schultz, who was also an illustrator. And they, these Bruno Schultz described a metaphysics, actually, of animation for them. And he's been a, a, a leading figure in the work, all the work they've done. You also see some small images of the, of the Clay brothers, their uh, identical twins. 
uh, at home in Philadelphia, and they left very early to go to uh, Eastern, Middle East, or some uh, Eastern Europe, because that was where they felt artistically best, best at home. Um, I also found out that they um, illustrated, they were illustrators, that was their original training, was as illustrators. Uh, there's an incredible background to this that I can't get into. And these are some of the book covers that they, that they wrote out. So the research took me into this idea of how to interpret um, text into images. Took me again, um, these are illustrations, are artworks, pencil drawings, placed in the in Philadelphia as in my first studies. Um, took me to um, their interest in anatomy, there's a play body you'll find in um, one of the puppets. It took me to um, Art Brut, which is where I met Hillary <laughs> at CAA when I was giving a talk on their work in Art Brut. Um, Cesar Lombrosio, and an obvious influence for, that mo most people know is uh, Polish, pop, uh, Polish uh, film posters. Another central figure for them is Robert Bolzer, and I just, sorry, I just have to look at him <laughs> because it was such a joy. Uh, Bolzer died in a sanatorium in Harrison, Switzerland, so the place came a few times and we, we did a kind of homage tour um, to, to go to the place that he died. And the reason you see these two images, I'm sorry they're not as good as I thought they would be, is Walter wrote in micrograms, and this is um, an image that influenced a very important work the film did by a, a woman who was uh, in a, an insane asylum. Um, she had dementia praecox, and it says, come, sweetheart, come, and she wrote hundreds and hundreds of pages. And the phrase paired this, this idea and this concept with Stockhausen's music. Imagine that. Uh, that then took me to musicology, which was completely new territory for me, and I'm so grateful to the people around the world who I talked about this, uh, as you do when you're trying to write something, who recommended wonderful books. And one was Louise Watermeet from Dr. Mark Barker here, that helped me find my way into thinking about sound and noise, which is half the poem. And my favorite chapter was actually the sound one. It also meant I could go to their um, shootings. I mean, the, uh, the film they made in 1995, Instant I was on set. And my photograph on the left that's published in the book shows you the colors that, even though the film is black and white, how, what careful attention they took. They choreographed their actors with as much care as their puppets, that's what they say, and I started to realize that there was a choreography going on. Any of you who, do, who have done Tai Chi may recognize that movement. <laughs> that's where they got that from. Um, they also did another film, it's about every 10 years, uh, called um, the piano trimming of earthquakes uh, that work is similar. There are certain motifs that run through all of their films, um, and this is also something I read in the final chapter. The plays also do set design for opera, ballet, and theater. Um, this also took me into another place of, of performance. And again, I started finding motifs uh, throughout the, run throughout their work, uh, trams. There are trams in almost every single piece of uh, film that they'll make, unless it's a commission. Uh, that's very, very focused on something. These are pencil drawings they made when they were boys. <clears throat> the Quays also um, make a, a lot of other work that people don't know about that's under the radar. So the book tried to open up, to get them out of that ghetto, so-called ghetto, I hate to use that word, animation into art, yeah? And uh, I think it worked. Uh, they've had a recent uh, huge exhibition at MoMA. I'll show you an image from in a second. And um, they, they really belong there, like, I'd say probably about five percent of the animation from the piece of the movie. This is part of an exhibition they did called Dormitorium. It was uh, 18 of their set designs in wonderful places and strange kind of uh, uh, dilapidated buildings. This is them shooting a film commissioned by the Mutu Museum in Philadelphia uh, using um, uh, uh, artifacts from the museum of body, bodies and the history of medicine. Um, and this is a dance piece that they did. So you finish a book, you don't have really have an exhibition, um, but you have a little stand at a book, uh, oh, there's your manuscript you have to go through, takes another year. You have a little stand at Cinema Studies, somebody writes about you, I got a, a book of the month I was very happy about, Insight and Sound, but my favorite moment was this young boy who bought that book, he was doing animation, he was 10 and he asked me for my autograph. <laughs> it was just, it was just so moving, made those 10 years worth it. So the Quays are continuing to work. The next feature is again on Bernicholls, and they had a remarkable exhibition at the MoMA that I went to three times when I was there, and I'm preparing to write something about that. So they've arrived. So while I was doing all of this, um, the book was published in 2011, of course I was doing many other things. Um, I 
graduate uh, with my PhD. We didn't have the costumes in Zurich. Uh, and, uh, but in 2005, I founded together with the team, that's the stand in 1999, uh, four people, a piece of paper, we started a festival. I really come from counterculture, subculture, grassroots, basement kind of stuff. We started with a piece of paper, a fax machine, one computer and 90,000 pounds, or 90,000 francs. They now have incredible offices, a half a million pounds, and they pay themselves. We didn't. So the people doing it now are who are our assistants, and they've taken it on, and I think that's the one thing you should write. Um, so I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, or behind. I just want to show you a few images of people that were, I'm sure you're so terrible, um, people that were very meaningful. Dick Arnold um, was one of the champions. We have his, part of his collection, and it's going to build the basis for a research bed. These are just, we had a lot of parties, many people, many artists, uh, lots of discussions. They thought, I was thinking about lots of animation, not just the Queen Brothers. And it tended to happen in rooms like this, that we squatted or could rent for hardly anything at all. And we lived on, I can I say this, bread, cigarettes, and coffee. And wine. That's the kind of interest I could say. Then in 2000, I got a strange phone call. Um, my job was running out at the university. I was a uh, lecturer there um, from some place called Parno. <laughs> and I got the job, a uh, senior uh, senior fellow and I came to set up what's the animation research center that I think has been basically shut down, which is a bit of a pity. All I wanted to point out was I got mm, questionably, pleasurably not saddled with uh, two collections, Health and Bachelor and Bob Godfrey, British collections. There were more than two million art works, pieces of art, artifacts, and half that <coughs> was um, and that's what kept me busy 50% of my time when I was there for 10 years. That's just some materials, and that was my fabulous team. I worked with so many students and volunteers that have all gone on to do amazing things, not in hardly any of them are actually filmmakers, even though that's what they study. I also did some exhibitions with this work. I'm moving to this idea of stuff and matter. Um, because what you find in those boxes is, it, it's, I can't even describe it. So what we try and do is we try and show the work, let people see what the process is of going from ideas to storyboard to script to the drawings, to the line drawings, to an exhibition, to the actual film. So I did a number of exhibitions. So in 2010-11, I'd been fighting, fighting, fighting for a place because all this was off-site. We had to really travel to get to it. I bought a huge room. I worked with an architect. I got a white cube, black floor, and that line of space I always wanted. And then I came here. <laughs> <laughs> As things go. Things happen in 10-year cycles. So I was starting to be very interested in stuff again, but different kinds of stuff. Um, this is an example of an animator at work, the animation people will know what that looks like, and how you start to work with the storyboard. That turned into an exhibition called Space Tricks that uh, took place at the Museum of Zurich, uh, Museum of Design in Zurich, uh, the world-renowned design museum. I, have, I got everything I wanted. Uh, I, I co-curated with um, Anders Janser, there was a dedicated architect, there were five assistants. I got to travel all over the place and go and talk to people about their things. And in the end, we had 66 cases, 66 frames with artwork, and the films were secondary. They were the small monitors there. That then traveled to Zurich, or sorry, I'm, I would just like to show you some stuff. The top film uh, is a display of a film that is made from knitting and crocheting. The entire scenario, the entire set, all the puppets are knitted. And this is a collage film that uh, uses cutouts from uh, what the fellow um, Virgil Woodricks calls the entire history of cinema. But the favorite one for most people, as usual, it was Ardman's beaks to show how they make their faith and speak their vowels, make parks Ardman um, studios. So it, it traveled, it came to Farnham and blessed them. <laughs> but the architect forgot to include the electric socket things along the wall. So it meant that everything that came couldn't be mounted because the cases had to sit on the frame. So I spent Christmas, New Year in the bottom left picture putting up um, pieces of wood so everything could be set up. So apart from those little glitches, uh, it was a very successful exhibition um, that also traveled to other places in Europe. That's a card that we made. It was uh, we got little write-ups, uh, even though it was in the countryside in Surrey. And I'll come back to the tape later. You see there in a second. 
as Lakar mentioned, I've done some curating and curatorial advising in the Barbican. And I just want to show you this because what I notice what we do over time, uh, especially if you're working between with artists, writing, um, working in exhibition installations, you, you start spending a lot of time standing up and talking to people and having lots of wine and being parties. And then you start sitting down <laughs> and you start talking to people. And then you start sitting down with big groups of people and start organizing groups and being on juries. And then you end up standing and talking to them. <laughs> so that's just a little kind of percent. And I think most of us who, who are writing-based people know that or have that same experience. <clears throat> So back to the lecture. So since the virtual use of computer, um, digital computer generated image realism, CGI, in almost all areas of film production, the question today is not what is animation, but rather what is not. And film and media studies, whose object, celluloid, will soon be obsolete, are engaging more to improve the profile of animation and cinema theory, but with an em emphasis on <coughs> CGI, um, on the aspiration of CGI realism, and at a price for the pre-digital and non-graphic animation I'm just showing you now. What's largely, largely missing in these recent debates is an approach to CGI's precursors, the non-digital animation, and the solid work in writing and thinking achieved regarding history techniques and aesthetics. This was a main driver to develop a proposal for a journal that's now in its ninth um, year of publication that Pahar mentioned. And I'd just like to point out two um, special issues. At the core of my research are the ethical, aesthetic, and cultural implications of what I call pervasive animation in visual culture. And this also determined the intellectual and philosophical arena of the proposal and of the journal. And I work with a brilliant team of associate editors that are moving this project along. I'm attempting to expand the canonical typology of animation to its entire visual and cultural realm. A way to visualize this is the metaphor of an iceberg of animation production and what I want to include, not just me, that's the royal we, but an I. When I say I, I mean we. There's lots of us wanting to do this. We want to include the 80% that lies below the surface of what gets made and distributed for cinema screens. This includes much of what most audiences do not see, either because it doesn't look like animation, or because of the dominance of cultural distribution and broadcasting. An example of this in the journal, fine examples, are um, two special issues. One was guest edited by Dr. Bartlett, who's here, who's a Stan Vanderbeek scholar, and it's become a key ac academic reference for this art art artist's work and a huge correction to a misunderstanding <coughs> of him within the arts and culture, or arts and, and film. And it was also a special issue dedicated, uh, uh, guest edited um, by Jeffrey Scholar, a uh, uh, film scholar, no, Jeffrey Scholar, a film scholar, <laughs> and experimental film uh, that was located in East Berkeley. This was also the aim of Pervasive Animation, a symposium I organized in collaboration with Stuart Comer, another fabulous collaborator who's sadly gone to MoMA. <laughs> He's left us. Uh, and we did this at Tate Modern in 2007. And I began exploring this notion with a really wonderful group of international artists and scholars that I met in the travels and convinced that they should think about animation, shift everything you know, and make that your object of study. You can write something beautiful. That's how the journal is. That's how we get copy mostly. And these are some of the great and the good. I'm sorry you can't really see the, the names, but it's everyone from Lisa Cartwright to Vivian Sobchak, Sean Cubitt, Michael Snow, Siegfried Zielinski, and then that. And one of the things I made sure of in my funding bid was that it will be perpetually online. 4,000 pound, pounds, always put it in your bid, and it will be recorded in your application perpetually, like what they're doing here now. <coughs> So six years later, Pervasive Animation was published this summer, and if you take a look at the author's later, later book launch, launch, just keep it flying over there, you'll see that quite a few are not nominally known as animation scholars, and that their film examples are also below the surface, so to speak. So now I've got about 10 minutes, no, yes, about 10 minutes to deal with the second theme, which is about animation in the workplace and research. It's something, there's something that I've observed many times uh, over the and if you mention the word animation uh, in one context or another, like here, uh, unless you're in a room with experts, uh, often it brings with it misconceptions or cliches until the term is narrowed down to what's actually being talked about. So a simple example of that is right now, I'd like you to think about animation. Just 
think about it for a minute. Can you see this a little bit better than I can? Okay. Most people tend to start with Pixar, think about some fat scans, machinima, entertainment. When you get to the right hand side, it looks a little bit different. And this is what I'm going to talk about now. <laughs> this shows how animation is pervasive in contemporary movie image culture. So now that we've seen the matter and the stuff of animation, which is more on the left hand side, I'll turn to its digital progression of computer animation. As pre-digital pure animation standard space merges with digital production te techniques, much of contemporary digital visual culture is unthinkable without it. Whether it's transformation of cinema, its use in games, installation art, performance, smartphones, sci-tech and industrial visualization tools, or in the spatial politics of social media, animation's increasing pervasiveness is influencing our understanding of how we see the world, particularly when something is invisible, or when something invisible, immobile, or non-extent needs to be the left poem note this notion of the animation as entertainment, the right, or what you find in the home, research, and the workplace. Animation always was and continues to be an indispensable visualizing resource for scientists, both in research and in explaining outcomes to less scientifically related audiences. Much of our knowledge about the world around us originates in the STEM subjects, but alongside the cultural remits, the arts and humanities should and could, can and should play a bigger role in communicating these kinds of knowledge. I've always been interested in the STEM sub subjects, not least because my father was a professor of forestry, but my mother, my mother's an artist, and she helped me to start thinking about abstract and applied sciences, science through animated art, art, artistic media. And then this is what I've been exploring in the last decade or so. And it's uh, partly why I'm very happy that a few people outside the school of art design here. Over the years, I've been working with Professor Dr. Jan Korvink at Intech in Fiber and Breisgau uh, at Yale Public Ludwig uh, University. We have a memorandum of agreement that keeps kind of getting delayed because he keeps getting promoted and promoted and promoted <laughs> and works on projects that he gets a million, two million, and three million pounds for. But we're working on this project about how the pervasiveness of micro and nano systems technology in the sciences mirrors animation's pervasiveness in visual culture. For my part, the next slide should be apparent that I'm taking a distinctly ethical approach to this. And I'm using the term pervasive in the sense of a known or unknown, sometimes unwelcome, influence of an effect that is widely spread. That's how I'm using pervasive. So I'd like to walk you through a few slides again. Um, what you see on the left, uh, we have a, a cancer uh, at Middlesex is a biomedical science department and it's, there's a group there working on image, imaging and therapy of skin cancer. And the project there is targeting tumor cells with drug-coated gold nanoparticles. These are some examples of what other people are doing um, around the world, <coughs> visualizing things that you can't see, how to describe it. You have to show it in the image. On the right, um, we have a school of law here. I've talked to some people there about forensics. And what you're seeing here is a recreation of unseen crimes using physics and biometric and biomedic, biokinetic, biokinetic modeling. Architecture, it's not animated, but I couldn't resist. Rem Kohlhaas's um, uh, draft for um, Le Le the Leal district in Paris. I bet if he'd animated it, he would have got a vote. <laughs> um, so that's an example of architecture. There's also an early iteration from 1999, 1999 about the Dantium from MIT. And a Mobius house from Un Studio. On the right, I'm sure our students are already working with um, interactive and uh, computer programs, and if they're not, I'm sure they will be soon. Um, but you can also go online and choose the carpet for your home um, with interact interactive animations. And there's also, I think there was a, a 3D printed house that was first created using um, animation modeling. It's a 3D color printed house. We have a 3D printer artist in art and design. So in case you don't know that, tell everybody. It's amazing. <coughs> um, what is all, animation can also be used for is, for instance, flooding. We've got, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, Professor Hazel Faulkner leads the Flood Hazard Research Center. And the School of Art and Design, Simon Reed has been working with the arts uh, and um, flood hazards, but estuaries mainly. Um, it's also very important and useful for, glo for global, global and humanitarian politics. 
below is a game called Death and Dark Lord. Um, you can choose your avatar and find out ways if you can save your family or not by not getting enough water or not from the well. You gain points, your family dies, you die. It's a, a really interesting way to find out what's actually going on now. Um, and somebody wrote about this for the pervasive animation book. It's the reason I know about it. She told me about it. Um, the, on the top right, uh, this, that's an avatar. Uh, Jackie Voss interviewed this documentary. She interviewed people who were involved in immigr immig immigrating to the <coughs> USA, and they could sh choose their own avatar. So you hear them talking, and <laughs> they have these avatars because they didn't want to show themselves on the screen. Yeah? Jonathan Hodgson, our award winning right here in the corner, um, the head of program uh, for animation, has just recently done um, Amnesty International film on juvenile execution in Iran, yeah, as well as others. And part of the reason I'm here is because this program is so political and ethical and just fabulous. <laughs> so um, I'm really looking forward to working together with, with you in the next year or so. We need to put in a funding bid for this. Also a climate change um, uh, game called Power Up that's, I think IBM made, you can go and play it and download it and find out how to save the planet as well. And this is not, not a joke. I mean, this is, we're the people that are not going to experience what we've done, our generation, so um, animation is very, very useful for educating and instructing. Which leads me to the next set of slides. And for instance, material, mental health and autism, we've got uh, social sciences here as well. And the film on the left is an animated documentary called Snack and Drink. It's about a young boy who goes to get a snack and a drink. He's filmed in a documentary situation, and then they use something called the little shop to alter, to use the images underneath, but maybe give a sense. My interpretation of it is maybe what Ryan is feeling when he moves through the world and looks and sees. It's one of the most sensitive uses of animation I've ever seen. Um, the middle image are what happens when artists work with science. The top is a film that used photograms exposed to a Tesla coil, frame by frame. Photograms exposed to a Tesla coil. And it's one of the most, it's called energy. And when you see the film, you know why. Our own semi, UK semiconductor work with scientists. They go into the labs, and that's an interpretation called magnetic movie, how magnetic curves uh, uh, things might move around. The film in the uh, image at the bottom is from a film called Forms from Akin Paiola. It won the grand Golden Nika, the Grand Award for Computer Animation on the jury. I was in at Aris Electronica in Minsk this year. If I had known how they made it, I wouldn't have given them the prize. They, oh, actually, they know that. Don't let me see it either. <laughs> because I found out that it's a beautiful film. Um, you, you don't know what it is. You sit and watch it, and your whole body moves. You, you don't know why. What they did was they, it was part of the, um, Cultural Olympiad, and they worked with uh, images, uh, films of uh, super athletes diving, running, swimming, doing all the things in triathlons, and they captured that using algorithms and uh, uh, kinetic um, software. It's beautiful, but it's not that hard to do. It's having the idea. And on the right um, is animation used in performance. The top is the Quay Brothers, who did, uh, they do a lot of this. They did, um, uh, background animation for a performance of Bartok at the Wilton here in London. This is a woman who's actually performing uh, with animation being projected on her body. She's been on, she's had two TED Talks, one at TEDx and one on TED, uh, about the work that she's doing. And at the bottom, for any fashion people in here, it's an animated hologram for a catwalk. It's everywhere. <coughs> so, I'm developing a taxonomy of styles for these kinds of animation, from mimetic replication, or it's really photography, derivative styles, innovative techniques, and developments to uh, and developments to emergent computer aesthetics that include interactive and simulation intelligence. That aim, as to gain my talk, is to bring together artists, designers, and scientists to work together. The sciences need artists. And I'll explain why very briefly before I come to the close in the next set of slides. Jan Burbink and I have also, also have an aim for the development of knowledge to narrow a long standing cultural divide between science and art and design and the wider humanities, <coughs> aka CPC and those two cultures. This originates in a set of current divisions that we developed as part of a larger philosophical project that we want to soften. If you look at the left, We've got science and technology, which is pervasive in 
other ways of understanding it, not always in a negative way. And the art, art and design of humanities that are really can be different ways. I'll just pull out a few examples. If you look at, for instance, um, scientific innovation, wonderful. How are you going to get people to watch it? How are you going to get them to be interested? Work with an artist and help them introduce a kind of narrative. One of the projects I did uh, at the University of Freiburg was work with, I'm not an animator, but I know how to do it, um, work with the people that were making animations to help them develop a story, some kind of story about the, the pi junction magnetic flow of their particles. It was amazing, it was remarkable, and it makes their work much more accessible. So the other main points here are knowledge. If any of you remember the nano scare that uh, there was this thing going around after Michael Crichton's prey came out that maybe someone was going to spray the air with viral nanoparticles and we'd inhale them and we'd all vote for George Bush, right? That's where <laughs> knowledge, power, fear, and wisdom uh, come together. Again, how do you translate the specialist languages of science into secular language of the arts? It's really about the luxury of the first world as well and how do you move into utility, second and third worlds? Death and Darkness is a very good example of that. Two cultures, holistic worldview, invisible worlds, make them visible. So we're working with a set of themes um, that roughly translate those. Again, pervasive on the right, art ubiquitous on the left. And I'm really hoping to engage <coughs> with colleagues and students uh, through Middlesex schools for this project. There's so much to do, there's, it's exciting, and there's great, great opportunities for employment for students afterwards. You don't have to be an animator and go and animate somebody's hair in Pixar. You can be an animator and then actually go and work on humanitarian projects like some of our, our animators in the school do. You can be a scientist in computer animation and find out how to actually tell the narratives of what science is doing so that people will actually watch it and you can change what goes on in some of these terrible nature shows that we get broadcast. I leave up BBC because they're usually pretty good. So I'm going to come to a close now. Um, and the next iteration of my project that Vakar introduced, mentioned pervasive animation, will be a period of ex exhibition again at the Museum of Design Zurich. We have a great kind of partnership that goes way back. And they are moving to this fabulous new place called Tony Audio in Zurich. This is the beautiful original building. So we're going to have 600 square meters <laughs> to fill. This is Andres at the opening of Space Tricks. Um, I know him as a friend, a uh, like-minded co-conspirator. Again, we studied film studies at the same time at the University of Zurich. We've got a number of themes. One of these is urban screens. We're at, we're at the kind of, um, the, 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 the place when you're curating anything, it can be a book, I curate books actually, to an exhibition. How do you decide? How do you narrow down? So my, my method of working tends to be everything, like the red sun, and then how do I narrow that down, filter it down, like taking grapes, make the wine, and then you make the broffa and the ocean. So it's a little bit the process of how I work. So we're in this gathering, hunter-gathering stage of, what we do know is we're not going to be working with narrative. It's not about narrative animation, it's much more about um, art design um, uh, and really presenting visitors with experience of animation to show it how it's pervasive in daily lives. So there's urban screens, uh, everything from like in Tampa that had to be, that was about uh, uh, the flooding in Florida down to, I'm pretty sure that that's Times Square. I haven't been to New York for a while. And the use of LED lights or, uh, this is also for me in animation, it's using the windows in building, turning them off and on, and you create an animated image. That for me is also an animation. Um, we're also very interested in information learning and communication. Again, if anyone here is from social sciences, um, please come and talk to me. <laughs> uh, maybe we can get you involved. And this theme in, in explores how animation is defining ongoing media conversions and new screens and platforms, how it's replacing real jobs of animated employees, and shifting control of domestic and learning environments from people to programs. The scanner that's at Sainsbury's is just the beginning. <clears throat> decision making and design process is central because it's a museum of design. Uh, and this looks at animation techniques in art design and con consumer products especially. Alongside artistic media of paint, metal and wood, 
In many artist studios, uh, designs are created and tested using CG animation, imaging for everything from initial design and color palettes to virtually testing stress loads of materials. And this is one of my favorite. It's actually a chair. And what they did was they animated it and stretched it out, and they made the fabric weave look like the stretched out animation. Stunning. Put that on a model, put it on a catwalk, put a hologram around her, or him. One that I'm particularly concerned about and I want to work on more um, is this idea of real and virtual family roles. I'm not alone. Many, many people are thinking and working about this, and it's a generational thing. I'm in my 50s. Someone who's 10 or 20 is going to think very differently. So new media platforms are invading the com communal locus of the living room. And as young people withdraw into the bedrooms with their laptops and meetings, this is affecting family structures and communication. This theme aims to inform public understanding of the impact this has on student consumption and defining visual environments in teaching and learning. Just one more, I've got to show, oh, this, I had to show you. These are uh, old games cassettes, uh, the, the software uh, cartridges that you use. And there's an amazing museum in Linz that I went to. And there were so many people, geeks, drooling, <laughs> wanting to rip open that plastic <coughs> and take it home. And of course, products for children. We've got an especial interest in so-called digital natives from an early age. Here are examples of animation and interactivity. The one at the top I would never have known about if I hadn't found out from Mark Bartlett that Stan Vanderbeek, who did a special issue on Stan Vanderbeek, first worked in animation on a show called Winky Dink and You. <laughs> you could buy, it was on television, black and white, you would buy, if I'm right, a package, you'd buy something in the store, and you'd get semi-transparent paper, sticky things, crayons, and then when the fellow on television, in the television said, now you can draw on a winky dink, draw a flower, draw a tree, the children would draw. It's interactive, already happening. So what we're going to do, and what's important uh, partly, is to also do a little bit of media archaeology to understand where these things come from. That ends my talk. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.